you are, you got a hit show, you got a house in Malibu, you're partying, yeah. celebrities are coming over. And then in 1979, the show gets canceled. And you didn't even know it was coming. Ernest Lee Thomas, a prominent figure from the beloved television series What's Happening, is unveiling concealed aspects of his life previously kept away from the public eye. Recent reports suggest that Thomas is openly discussing a range of issues, from alleged racism within the production to the unfortunate fate of Fred Berry. With a commitment to transparency and a desire to share untold stories, Thomas is now opening up about the hidden truths of his life, both on and off the set. Let's delve into these revelations and explore the untold narratives surrounding the iconic show. Famous for his role in the 70s hit sitcom What's Happening, the legendary actor Ernest Lee Thomas has navigated the highs and lows of Hollywood life. During the show's success, he enjoyed the privileges of wealth and fame, basking in the limelight as a sought-after personality. However, after the sitcom's cancellation, Thomas faced a challenging period marked by regrettable life decisions, propelling him down a difficult path that demanded redemption. This is your identity at this point. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're Raj. Yeah, <laughs> from right. Britain, you know, yeah. from what's happening. Right. And now you're canceled. Yeah. And you went into a depression over that. Oh, yeah. Emerging as a prominent figure in the mid-70s, the star ascended into the spotlight with his professional debut in the 1974 Broadway production of Love for Love. Before this milestone, he devoted time to honing his acting skills at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. The pursuit of a full-time acting career prompted him to make a move to Los Angeles. Real quick, because you know Father's Day is coming up. Yes. And this is Los Angeles Sentinel TV. Oh. In rapid succession, the actor solidified his presence with a role on The Jeffersons as Ronnie Walker. During the same year, he made a memorable appearance on the 1975 hit series Beretta, laying the groundwork for his subsequent involvement in the Brady Bunch Hour. Beyond his accomplishments on the small screen, Thomas made a significant impact with notable roles in movies. His diverse filmography includes portraying Kailuba in the miniseries Roots, Mr. Omar in Everybody Hates Chris, Lenny in Basketball Girlfriend, and Sidney in Malcolm X. Intriguingly, Thomas was initially considered for the lead role of Kunta Kinti in Roots, but ultimately embraced the character of Kailuba after missing out on the lead role. Ernest Thomas has undoubtedly left his mark in various movie roles, but his most enduring and iconic portrayal remains that of Roger Raj Thomas on What's Happening and its sequel, What's Happening Now. These television series not only showcased Thomas's acting prowess, but also solidified his status as a beloved and memorable figure in the world of sitcoms. Interestingly, Thomas first learned about the series on the set of The Jeffersons. Mary White, the agent of Isabel Sanford, who played Louise Jefferson, played a pivotal role in encouraging Thomas to audition for the new pilot. Thomas recalls, My first sitcom was The Jeffersons, and she was loving what I was doing as a guest star. She came over and told me, There's a new pilot called Cooley High, and I think you'd be perfect for it. I had an agent already, so I thanked her and told her I'd tell my agent. When I did, he got all upset, asking, Who in the hell is she to tell you about this show? Despite the initial skepticism, Thomas landed the audition, leading to his iconic role as Roger Raj Thomas. This pivotal role catapulted him to stardom, and the legend has been candid about the journey to securing this breakthrough and the sacrifices he had to make along the way. He once revealed, I lost a few friends as I got cast as Raj because everybody wanted to be Raj. I auditioned against over 200 actors for the role. Enduring numerous callbacks and rigorous screen tests, Thomas ultimately secured the coveted role. He attributes landing the part to what he perceives as a divine decree, shaped by his prayers and unwavering faith. I just knew this was going to be a hit, but they said it wasn't funny enough. It was a um, one camera, you know, and uh, they had uh, the original guy. Assuming the role of Raj at the young age of 26, Thomas defied age barriers as he swiftly ascended to success. The show became an instant hit, catapulting him to fame during its run from 1976 to 1979. As a pivotal character, Thomas easily won the hearts of fans, becoming a beloved figure. The success of the show not only brought him widespread acclaim, but also substantial wealth and affluence, marking a remarkable achievement for the then young actor. And then later they called and said, well, you know, we're going to do a three camera. We're going to keep you, get rid of everybody else and cast another 
uh, group around you. Thomas later reprised the iconic role in the sequel, What's Happening Now?, which returned to the screens in 1985 after a six-year hiatus, extending his association with the beloved character for another three years. Seemingly thrust into the challenges of managing the weight that accompanies a life of fame and affluence at a relatively young age, Thomas found himself grappling with the aftermath of what's happening going off the air. His journey took a downturn, influenced by a series of questionable life choices. Yeah, from right. Where, you know, yeah. from what's happening. Right. And now you're canceled. Yeah. And you went into a depression over that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, major depression, more drugs, because Coke, I haven't introduced to Coke at that time, and Remy Martin. The abrupt cancellation of the show came as an unexpected blow for Thomas, who revealed that he learned about it not through official channels, but from a newsstand vendor. This moment of sudden realization had a profound impact on him, shaping the trajectory of his life in the years that followed. He said all that was required was deciding to trust in God and establishing a personal relationship with him. Thomas openly acknowledged experiencing a period of depression following the disheartening revelation about the show's cancellation, which unfortunately led him into the grips of substance abuse. He grappled with addiction to illicit substances such as C, crack, and M. And crack. Yeah, which came in the 80s, though. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, that came in the 80s, yeah. Okay. Well, actually, like, the, like, like 1980, like 79, 80. Reflecting on the experience of substance abuse, Thomas admitted that initially it induced a powerful and euphoric feeling of ecstasy. However, he also acknowledged the dark side that followed, where the aftermath of the high brought about a descent into negativity. The allure of the substances led to encounters with sinister thoughts, leaving one with a pervasive sense of inadequacy and negativity. Can you have this euphoria? Like, oh my God, I want to feel this way all my life. But then that downside, then the devil comes, yeah. right? And every thought, every evil thought. Initially, the star attempted to impose limits on his de-use. However, over the years, the situation took a devastating turn, prompting him to recognize the urgent need to break free from the grip of addiction. The turning point for Thomas arrived when he faced eviction from his home, having depleted all his financial resources and unable to meet rent obligations. Following this upheaval, the icon sought refuge by moving in with his sister, who, despite his financial struggles, welcomed him with open arms. This marked a crucial juncture in his life, propelling him towards the realization that a change was imperative. Shortly thereafter, Thomas, fueled by determination, embarked on a journey to break free from his de-addiction by reconnecting with his Muslim roots. He turned to prayer, earnestly seeking divine intervention to aid him in overcoming his struggles. A pivotal moment in his path to recovery occurred when his cousin introduced a Muslim acquaintance. This individual engaged in candid conversations with Thomas, providing guidance and influence that played a crucial role in motivating him to pursue a clean and sober lifestyle. My cousin brought this Muslim guy over and and uh, I needed something, you know, as Christians would say, well, why didn't you? I said, you guys are too busy getting high to talk about Christ. <laughs> and my Jewish producers. The actor from Funny People has been transparent about his deep faith, which originated in 1975 when he forged a personal connection with God and embraced Islam. He attributes every accomplishment in his life to God, whom he trusts above all others. Despite his open embrace of Islam, some people have speculated that he changed his religion due to the negative impact of the show. But that had been done already. But I'm telling everyone, that's my part. That was my part. As God would have it, you know, uh, I happened to go at that time. Having weathered the challenges and lows in his journey, Thomas now dedicates himself to spreading the message that God loves everyone equally. He firmly believes that God is ready to work miracles in the lives of others, emphasizing the universal nature of divine love and intervention. In his journey of faith, Thomas discovered that all it required was the decision to trust in God and establish a personal relationship with Him. Inspired by his profound experiences, he penned the book, From Raj to Riches, Overcoming Life Through Faith. Through this book, Thomas aspires to motivate and encourage others to prioritize their relationship with God. He believes that by putting God first, everything else, even in the complex world of showbiz, will fall into place. The book serves as a testament to his belief in the transformative power of faith and its potential to guide individuals through life's challenges. Moreover, Thomas was also up against 200 actors for the part. They were looking at, I would say, at least 200 people, Thomas recalls of the audition process, which lasted several weeks. I auditioned for the role of Preach Jackson in Cooley High, which became Roger Thomas in What's Happening. 
The days dragged on as Thomas awaited the final verdict. Those sleepless nights were not cutting it at all, he says with a laugh. I was so frustrated, it was like, make a choice. I won't be mad if it's not me, because at least then I know. It did not stop here. He also claimed that the show was a racist. It was definitely a positive, Ernest Thomas, who played lead character Roger Thomas, told Today. I think a supernatural positive effect because of the absence of blacks on television. Even though Good Times was out there and Jefferson's and Sanford and Son were on, it wasn't the youth. What's happening? was these three teenagers, which I think had an impact on all cultures, so that everybody can identify with friends, teenage friends. The comedy boasted strong and memorable characters, including Roger, his shy friend Dwayne played by Haywood Nelson, and Rerun played by Fred Berry, their dim-witted yet lovable and overweight companion. Roger's sister Dee, portrayed by Danielle Spencer, added a touch of sibling rivalry, constantly coaxing her brother for quarters, while their hard-working single mother, played by Mabel King, served as the moral center. Hey, Raj, how you doing? Hey, Raj, what's happening? The group of friends frequently gathered at the soda shop, where the wise-cracking waitress Shirley engaged in banter with the customers. The humor often included fast and furious fat jokes, raising questions about their appropriateness in today's context. Inspired by the 1975 film Cooley High, what's happening transcended racial boundaries and resonated with a diverse audience. Thomas believes that beyond providing laughs, the sitcom had a broader impact, connecting with people from all backgrounds over the years. It also helped with race relations, he said. I've talked to white folks over the years that hated black folks. I mean, goodness, they hated them, and their folks were that way. But as a child, when the folks were gone, they'd be channel surfing, right? And stumble over what's happening and find themselves staying there. And next thing you know, they're laughing. But they go, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to laugh. It chipped away the racism, he added, despite not becoming a ratings juggernaut. What's Happening thrived on the chemistry among its cast. Roger, known for his terrible dance moves, boisterous laugh, and tendency to mumble when in trouble, became a distinctive character. Rerun, with his signature suspenders and beret, showcased Kerr dance moves, while Dwayne's trademark greeting was, hey, 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 and he often gasped, nah, when disapproving of something. From the very first day of working together, Thomas sensed there was something special. I swear, man, it was like an out-of-body experience, he reflected. I don't know these people, but as soon as I walked in that room, man, it was a thing that I can't explain. They gave me chills. It's like we know each other already. The series took a new turn, leading to Roger and Rerun moving into their own apartment, where new characters were introduced. Among them were the white father-son duo of Big Earl and Little Earl, with the latter having a crush on Dee. I think they found it amusing, Thomas remarked about the show's audience. You know, you're not thinking about it because it's a little kid. As far as interracial relations, I think it really helped. Thomas also holds the belief that the series played a role in paving the way for other black-centered comedies in the 80s, such as The Cosby Show and 227. Thomas attributes the cancellation of the series to tension between Fred Berry and the show's producers. According to Thomas, the breaking point occurred when Barry accused the producers of being racist. This accusation, Thomas suggests, ultimately led to the show's cancellation, despite his belief that it could have continued. When asked about his favorite episode, Thomas didn't hesitate to respond. The two-part Doobie Brothers, hands down, he said, referring to the two-part episode in which the band performs a concert at the Friends High School, which the group had supposedly attended, and Rerun agrees to illegally record it in exchange for good tickets. It really set us apart from all the other shows, Thomas said, while adding that the members of the band were really good guys. In a memorable episode, Roger attempts to locate a band at their hotel by calling and cleverly asks, which doobie you be? When someone picks up, an iconic line that has left a lasting impact. Although the show concluded in 1979, its allure continued to grow, thanks to syndication, which began as early as 1980. What's happening? found a new and devoted audience. But then the show became more popular in reruns than on primetime, Thomas remarked. Who knew? 69 episodes, actually 65. The phenomenon of what's happening is most of these shows like Good Times and All in the Family. They got 100, 200 shows. It was only 69 episodes that people ate like popcorn. This resurgence set the stage for something virtually unheard of at the time, a reboot. After the show's cancellation, Thomas found himself inundated with fans at concerts, sparking an idea for a revival. 
you see photo photos of it now on the, on the internet. Uh, so that failed. So that was a disappointment. That's when I thought, well, well, maybe I was wrong. Despite facing disinterest from his former co-stars, writers, and his manager, Thomas found an unexpected ally in Muhammad Ali, who happened to be a fan of the original series. Encouraged by Ali, Thomas was inspired to persist. When I met Muhammad Ali, I was telling him about it, and he says, look, instead of complaining, just go to them. Go to the studio and tell them, Thomas recalled. Taking Ali's advice to heart, he did just that. Initially met with rejection, Thomas's perseverance paid off when executives recognized the enduring popularity of the reruns. This realization paved the way for what's happening now, marking it as one of the first reboots in TV history. The show premiered in 1985 and enjoyed a three-season run. In the original treatment for the reboot, Thomas envisioned Roger and Shirley being married, but this concept was eventually scrapped. He also revealed that Vanessa Williams was initially set to play his wife, Nadine, but lost the part due to the release of nude photos in 1984 after she was crowned Miss America. Despite these changes, Thomas remains content with the reboot, which notably introduced an unknown comedian named Martin Lawrence to the TV scene when he joined the series in 1987. Martin Lawrence, widely celebrated for his contributions to comedy, is regarded as a pioneer in the field. However, Ernest Lee Thomas presents a contrasting view, describing Lawrence as more than just a comedic talent, someone with an alleged arrogant demeanor. Thomas candidly revealed intriguing aspects of his experiences with fellow actor Martin Lawrence, offering a unique perspective on the entertainment industry. He delved into the dynamic between them, touching on issues of fame, arrogance, and personal challenges. Uh, yeah, he did get a start on what's happening. Who knew, you know? Uh, but, and I was, you know, I, I accepted him with open arms because, you know, the other cast members didn't want him on the show. To begin, Ernest Thomas looked back on the initial stages of Martin Lawrence's foray into the entertainment industry. Thomas acknowledged that Lawrence got his first significant opportunity on What's Happening, a piece of information that hadn't gained widespread attention. He had just done uh, Star Search, but he didn't uh, win. He didn't win Star Search. So his, his first professional gig was What's Happening. Okay. Now. Thomas shared the story of extending a warm welcome to Lawrence, even in the face of opposition from other cast members. He hinted at Lawrence's unmistakable comedic talent, making Thomas's choice to support him almost instinctive. But I, I was there with him when he was turned down by the uh, comedy store three times. Yeah, but that was it. He got his start on there. In that era, Martin Lawrence emerged as a promising star full of potential. His magnetic charisma and undeniable talent swiftly drew the attention of those in his vicinity, including Ernest Lee Thomas. The atmosphere on the set of What's Happening Now was infused with camaraderie and Lawrence's humor and vibrant energy breathed new life into the show. Nevertheless, as Martin Lawrence's career reached new heights, evident transformations unfolded. Thomas skillfully depicted how Lawrence's demeanor underwent a noticeable shift, a transformation characterized by a burgeoning sense of arrogance and an ever-widening disconnect from reality. This evolution became increasingly conspicuous as Lawrence ascended the ladder of fame and success. With each rung he climbed, Lawrence delved deeper into the realm of celebrity. You know, and it wasn't like he was, oh, he was just incredibly funny. You know, you know, now, of course, I love the Martin show, but he yeah. just didn't, it wasn't there. The weight of fame, the relentless demands of the industry, and the tempting allure of the spotlight evidently influenced Martin Lawrence's personality. Once a humble and motivated young artist, he now showed signs of conceit and self-importance. Ernest shared a compelling anecdote about a missed chance to collaborate with Lawrence. He described how Lawrence, to Thomas's surprise and disappointment, turned down a lucrative offer for a film project. Not only did he not talk, he could at least call me himself and said, no, you got the agent calling me. Ernest went further to explain the incident, saying, We made the offer. We offered him $500,000 for 13 days. Never heard from the agent after that. This incident served as a glaring example of how success can sometimes sever the connections between celebrities and their roots. The missed opportunity became a poignant reminder of how fame's alluring charm can cloud one's judgment. Lawrence's choice to reject the offer had consequences that extended beyond the immediate project, reflecting a broader transformation in his priorities and a distorted perception of his value in the industry. Fans are convinced that there might be some truth in Ernest's claims of Lawrence being blinded by fame. One of his his fan wrote, used to always see Mr. Ernest at the Pasadena CA library all the time. I would speak and he was always kind. 
Another one added, it's a fact. Money will change you, and if you didn't know, that's because you haven't experienced it. It's true what they say though, no money, no problems. One more person added, that brother's energy is genuine and I really appreciate that in itself. People always throw empty words around and when you call them on it, they can't be found. It's a sad affair, the state of selfishness that exists on all levels of life, no matter what your status is. I've given up on people and when bad things happen to us, it's judgment, so be it. With the passing of Barry, Hemphill, and King, he marvels at how the series continues to resonate. Thomas has encountered military personnel who find comfort in watching episodes on military bases, highlighting the show's enduring influence. Additionally, attending a pop culture convention revealed the show's ability to break down color barriers, leaving a lasting impression on fans. The first time we went there, we could not believe the line, we see all these lines of white people, he said. And I said, oh, somebody was really popular. And so one of the people working there said, they're waiting on you. They're waiting to get in to meet you. We could not believe it. Not only Thomas faced the challenges because of the show, one more actor went through the same thing, who was Fred Berry. Fred Berry remains a definitive example of an actor forever tied to a particular role. His portrayal of the beret and suspenders clad, constantly dancing Freddie Stubbs, aka Rerun, on the 1976 to 1979 teen sitcom, What's Happening? Barry not only accepted but also capitalized on the inevitability of being forever known as Fred Rerun Barry. Following the show, the majority of his post, What's Happening? roles were either reprisals of the character or cameos as himself. But, you know, one of the standouts was Fred Barry. Oh, yeah. AKA Rerun. Yes. Now, Fred kind of had an interesting background before joining the show. Yeah. However, the weight of being rerun took its toll on Barry. Despite becoming a millionaire by the age of 29, he struggled with the stress of success, leading him into a downward spiral of DNA. This decade-long addiction resulted in three S attempts. Eventually, Barry found sobriety in 1985 and later went on to become a Christian minister, marking a transformative chapter in his life. He said, I was a millionaire by the time I was 29, he told people in 1996. The stress of success got to me, and I got heavily into DNA. I was empty inside. Fred Berry's romantic life became notably complicated in the aftermath of his television success. Before his death in 2003 at the age of 52, Barry went through a total of six marriages, involving four different women, with two of his spouses marrying him twice. Despite the public scrutiny surrounding his personal life, Barry chose not to publicly disclose the identity of his estranged sixth wife. In response to inquiries about this particular marriage, Barry stated, She's been trying to get her 15 minutes of fame from me off of my name and my career ever since we got married. I don't want to give her that pleasure, as reported by People. The actor's personal struggles and complex relationships added another layer to his post. What's happening? Experiences. Married six times to four different women, Barry knew both the ups and downs of life, riding high on his earnings from what's happening, but crashing to earth when the show ended in 1979. He freely admitted that when he was at his top, it sort of went to his head, the Hollywood lifestyle, Shelton said. He told me that in an eight-month span, he blew $1 million on D and gambling. But in later years, he used that when speaking to school children. He was really motivated in trying to help kids, telling them not to do like he did. When the income from his acting career dwindled, Fred Berry's life took a downward spiral. Despite his talents, Berry found himself typecast as Rerun, the cheerful beret-wearing breakdancer from What's Happening, which made it challenging for him to secure roles outside of this character. In the East Coast, the guys are more acrobatic right, and did right. a lot more floor work. Right. In LA, in the West Coast, they're more kind of with the hand motions yeah. and the, you know, that type. According to Shelton, a friend of Barry's, the actor struggled to overcome this stereotype. Eventually, Barry decided to embrace and live with the rerun persona, finding a measure of acceptance. In later years, he began to experience a resurgence, making a comeback as rerun. Appearances on shows like Scrubs and Dickie Roberts brought him joy, as he felt he was getting a second chance at stardom. This comeback marked a positive turn in Barry's career, bringing him renewed satisfaction and recognition. And it really came from him. Yeah. He was the one that really invented a lot of that Fred Berry's ex-manager had penned a script for What's Happening, the movie, and Berry was actively shopping it around Hollywood. Additionally, he was working on an autobiography titled Tears of a Clown, the rerun Berry story, with the assistance of his friend Shelton. However, tragedy struck when Berry suffered a stroke. 
Although his speech remained intact, the stroke significantly impacted his motor skills. This turn of events was particularly poignant for Barry, who as one of the pioneers of breakdancing, suddenly found himself unable to walk without a cane. He was actually part of a, what I would call a breakdancing group yeah. called The Lockers. The Lockers, yeah. And, you know, as yeah. someone who was breakdancing, you know, in the 80s. Despite the challenges, Barry maintained an optimistic and upbeat outlook, reminiscent of his character Reran, until the day he passed away. Shelton recalled Barry's positive attitude, mentioning that he kept saying, oh, I'll be all right. I'll be dancing in a couple of months. This resilience and spirit defined Barry's approach to life, even in the face of adversity. One of his fans wrote, I miss Fred Barry. He was a talented character actor and dancer, very light on his feet. I remember he got his start on Soul Train. A lot of talent came off that show, RIP Rerun. So all these revelations suggest that only Ernest's life was difficult during his time in the industry, but also all the other actors who were linked to him were also in danger. And during all these years, everybody was just appreciating them for their remarkable acting. However, their lives seemed to be pretty messed up. That's it for today. See you in the next video. Until then, goodbye.